My name is Keith Grossman. I am the Global Chief Revenue Officer of Bloomberg Media. Um, but I specifically wanted to um, kick off tonight for a very special reason. Uh, I am a Cornell alum. And uh, I don't know how many people in this room are Cornell alums. Can I ask? This is awesome. And um, at Bloomberg, we opened up uh, in partnership with Cornell Tech, the campus, a uh, few weeks ago uh, with uh, a Sooner Than You Think conference. But my relationship with Cornell Tech actually predates my time at Bloomberg. It goes back to when I was at Wired and Ars Technica. And uh, Dan Hootenlocker, who's the dean of this school, approached me and Jeremy Snepar over here, and I'm going to embarrass him for a second, who's also a Cornell alum and said, uh, we're going into this competition for the New York uh, State Land Grant for $100 million. And um, we just want to pick your brain on alumni from Cornell that uh, are in the tech space. And what do you think of like this idea of Cornell coming after it? And what would be, what would be the angles that you take? And what was really fascinating was, was um, we sat down and we listened to Cornell give a pitch of how they were going to come into the space. And I don't remember if anyone remembers this competition that took place. It was really interesting. Um, but schools, what I learned in this uh, scenario was schools take a far more elegant approach than businesses do to their competition. So my first question was, is how are we going to beat Stanford? And the answer was, well, we are going to be Cornell. And we are, <laughs> we are just going to go out there, and we're going to do the best we could do. And I was like, but Stanford's crushing us. This is ridiculous. What's your Twitter handle? And um, if anyone knows it, the Twitter handle of Cornell, uh, as they were going into, the, um, into this, was Tech Campus NYC. And, um, and I left the meeting with Jeremy that night. And I was so upset. I was so frustrated. And I, and I went home. I couldn't sleep. And I, and I wake up at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, and I say to Jeremy, I go, mother, right? And I was like, <laughs> like they didn't register the Twitter handle Cornell Tech NYC. I was like, it's the perfect branded Twitter handle. It is everything that we need. And so um, Jeremy and I registered it. And we came up with a few rules. And the rules were very simple. It was, um, we would never slander Stanford, because we were representing Cornell, even though Cornell had not agreed to us representing Cornell. <laughs> um, but what we would do is, any time Stanford elevated concern about diluting their university to the East Coast, we would make sure the whole world saw it on Twitter, right? Just by reposting their links. And it was fascinating because what happened was, was I was traveling, Jeremy was traveling, uh, and we had to do this all mobile on our phone. And so we had this very easy password. Um, what was it, Jeremy? It was like KC123, right? It was something like that, just to log in. And we would just switch back and forth. I would send him a text and say, I can't do Twitter right now for the next you know, two hours. I'm in a meeting. Can you take care of Twitter? And he would handle it, and he would leave, uh, and he would do all the tweets. And we would just constantly get it going. And what we started to find was people started to follow us, like real people, real journalists and, and mayoral candidates started to follow us. So we started to realize we had power. And then we were approached by these two guys, Danny Stein and Gus Warren. And they said, um, it's great that you're talking to so many people. You have like uh, 6,000 followers at this point, but you need to actually turn it into something that's actionable. And so we said, like, what? And they said, um, how about a petition? And we said, sure. Um, who should we use? And we debated it for a little bit. And what it turned out was um, two Stanford graduates came up with moveon.org. So we thought it would be appropriate to put the Cornell uh, petition on moveon.org as like a little bit of a joke, right? And um, we started to ask for people to sign. And we got a few hundred signatures. And then one day, uh, I think Jeremy or I came across uh, a head of a department at Cornell who really wanted uh, this to happen. And so she opened up her listserv of her students to us to literally send them a note and say, hey, would you sign up for this um, uh, petition that supports uh, Cornell's Tech Campus bid in, in Roosevelt Island? And, uh, and we did it. We got like 2,000 signatures. It was amazing, right? And the next thing I know, I get an email from Cornell's legal team that says, stop representing us. <laughs> 
And I'm like, really, guys, I'm trying to help you. And they're like, stop it or we'll sue you. And I go, sue us and we'll put this letter on our Twitter handle that says we're you. No one's going to understand what's going on. <laughs> and uh, I, I started getting heated. And Jeremy's like telling me, calm down, calm down, calm down. And, um, and, I, and I emailed with Jeremy, uh, Dan Hootenlocker, who said, let me deal with this. And he elevated it to President Squirton. So this was unbelievable, right? And President Squirton looked at and he goes, so we're going to sue these two guys for helping us with this bid? No way. I'm going to open it up to the entire alumni listserv. And um, because he did that, we sent it out. And we got over 22,000 signatures to, to get the tech campus that's here today. What makes tonight, for me personally, and I can't thank you all enough for coming here, is um, this is the first time that I am actually in the campus and not outside. And so like, I, like I'm seeing something that's so real, that's so meaningful to me personally. What makes it even more meaningful is that the person who I did it with, my partner, is gonna be here tonight on stage talking about what he cares so much about, which is education alongside two incredible other academies who are doing it as well. And so with that, I wanna turn it over to Scarlett Fu. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. As mentioned, we have three incredible individuals from the field of education. They're all disrupting in one way or another. I want to introduce Jake Schwartz, uh, co-founder and CEO of General Assembly, Leah Balski, vice president at Coursera, and Jeremy Snepper, founder and CEO of New York Code and Design Academy. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, we are talking about uh, how education and business adapts to the paradigm shifts that's being created by technology and innovation. I think the best way to, to get started is to have each of you introduce your company's distinctive approach to education. What makes you different? Jake, why don't you start? Oh, that's a big question for an intro. Um, so, uh, well, look, we, we started GA in 2010. And um, it was really informed a lot by my experience sort of graduating from a fancy undergrad, getting out into the world and realizing I had no actual skills. And then eventually sort of relenting and going back to business school and sort of realizing in that moment that, um, you know, business school is really interesting and it's a combination of of sort of an investment mentality, but there's also sort of a toll-taking mentality in the process too, which is that companies are coming from one end and people who are a little lost are coming from the other and, and they get to sort of take a toll in between those two things. And I kind of felt like there was something missing in that whole process and that um, it was potential, there was potential to sort of dramatically increase the ROI that people are spending on education by, um, by really, um, decreasing the time and the cost on one hand and, and increasing the relevance of the skills we teach. So we do digital marketing, web development, data science, product management, um, and I mean it's changing all the time um, as we sort of, as the economy uh, keeps updating. Um, at the same time though, you know, what's, what we've seen incredible growth since then, and I mean that's really what's taken us to scale. We're in 20 different cities, uh, five different countries, four different continents. Um, but what's really exciting is that we've also, and people don't realize this, we've probably worked with now uh, almost 150 of the Fortune 500, um, over th a third of the Fortune 100. And we're doing a lot of work helping these companies think about their relationship to their talent in the future. Um, and it's just an exciting thing to see companies thinking that way, and it's sort of really part of what I think represents sort of the future of, of what we're building at GA. Okay, so helping companies find the right workers and train up the workforce. That's right. Leah, talk a little bit about what you guys do at Coursera, because didn't you guys start off as as the purveyors of MOOCs, those massive open online courses that were supposed to replace the university setting? Yeah. It was the end of the university. The end of the university, <laughs> absolutely. So, so for those who don't know the story, Coursera started about five years ago when two AI professors at Stanford decided to put their courses online. And lo and behold, their course is filled with hundreds of thousands of learners. And everyone was saying, oh no, why would anyone go to the university when they could just study all the content free online? Well, turns out people are still going to school, but the company has evolved tremendously. And what we end up doing is Coursera has now become the largest education destination site on the web with a partnership of over 150 universities who put their courses online and allow students to earn 
credentials, either courses, course credentials or degrees. And then like Jake and General Assembly, we also partner with companies helping them upskill and reskill their workforces. And what's interesting about Coursera and this broader education landscape is we really see a future where for people who haven't gotten the skills they need following their university years, they will need to go back to school, but we're helping universities actually extend into that lifelong learning space and be part of that future ecosystem. And Jeremy, uh, at New York Code and Design Academy, talk about what the distinction is of your coding boot camp versus another one, or versus General Assembly that, that Jake runs. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I mean, the, the Code and Design Academy evolved uh, really out of my experiences here in New York City. You know, talking about the different types of education. I went, I went to school at Cornell, as you heard earlier. Uh, you know, econ major. Econ major, liberal arts, uh, but no real tangible skills. <laughs> You know, so there's a theme here. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a theme broadly, globally. So I started my uh, career at a, at a film school, actually. And the film school did classes very similar to, to what GA and what the Coding Design Academy did, basically short-term intensive workshops. And it was all skills-based. Pick up a camera, shoot a film. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, it was vocational education. And when I was growing up, vocational, like the vocational school was like, you know, no one really wanted to go there. Mm. So that was always with me, you know, vocational education, skills-based education. Then I found myself, uh, you know, in investment banking for about seven years. And uh, at, a, at a firm called Mesa, where we were helping early stage startups raise capital. In fact, I used to go over to GA back in 2010, prospecting for clients, you know, Movable Link with Vivek over there. They're a great group. company. It was a great company, right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of companies got their start over at GA. Artsy. Uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And, you know, my clients would say, you know, I built financial models to go raise money, and my clients would say the same thing. We're trying to hire developers, and we can't find them. So I thought, well, why not take the model like that film school that I used to work at, but instead of teaching filmmaking and acting, we would teach web design and development. So we started teaching classes in conference rooms and really space wherever we can get up. And, you know, that's kind of how the company evolved. We, we took a little bit more of a tailored you know, a smaller, more personal approach than I think, uh, you know, some of the other schools did. And uh, it kind of served us well. We kind of flew under the radar for a while, but... Do you think you're reinventing college degrees? You know, I think there's always going to be a generational pull to college degrees, although I think it's weakening. Um, but I think most of our students are actually coming to us post-college. Hmm. Okay, so you don't necessarily see as many people coming from high school straight over to... I've got to tell you, it's increasing more and more. Hmm. And Leah, you guys see yourself as an arm of the university rather than a replacement of the university. I wouldn't say an arm, that's a little strong, but I think we are helping the universities innovate and also partnering with companies to do so. So I do think Coursera is actually in the process of reinventing the degree, starting with the master's degree and, and then moving down likely to BAs over time. And what we're doing specifically is taking this online course platform and allowing you to take a full degree, but in a way that you don't pay for the full degree up front. You can take the degree course by course and pay as you go and decide if you want to continue. And we're doing it at a, a cost that is completely disruptive. So an MBA on Coursera costs about $20,000. Sorry for all of you who are spending a lot of morning, <laughs> money on your Cornell degrees. Um, but you know, the bet is that there's a That's lot That's new, of right? I mean, this is a new thing. So it started about a year ago, quietly. Okay. Uh, but we're going to have thousands of people in it by the end of the year. Um, and, you know, the bet that we're taking is that there are tons and tons of people who, unlike the folks who have the time during their workplace to come to a place like this, would like to play a master's degree but just can't. Either they can't afford it mm -hmm. or they just can't do it while they're at work and the only other options they have on the market are to pay, you know, sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 for another big online degree or go to a, you know, low-tier university. So... We will see what happens. And Jake, you call what you offer just in time uh, because there are different price points and it's the opposite of a one-size-fits-all model. That's right. I mean, I think, um, I mean, look, this is, it's a very loaded question when you start talking about universities and, and are you replacing college? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is... Um, not yet. <laughs> not even close. To, and like, I think the reality is we're talking, I believe society is on a, I would say, 25 to 40-year journey of 
unbundling what it means to go to college and turning into something different. And the reality is, 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 is and, depend, and by the way, college is very different depending on which part of the socioeconomic ladder you sit on, even in the United States. That's very important to mention. But even for you know people sitting in this room, I mean, the reality is um, college, I think, has, has three different value propositions. I like the, one of them, and I think it's, it's a highly underrated one, is babysit your young adults. <laughs> Right? Um, you, you ask parents why it's important they go to college right away. It's like, well, what else are they going to do? Right? It's a it's a safe place to like you know experiment with drugs and like whatnot. Um, <laughs> Among other good. things, it's, it's the ultimate safe space. Right? Um, number two is is that you become a citizen of the world. Right? And I don't think anybody up here is claiming to do that. Really? I mean, Coursera more than most, and I do think there is actually a very valuable value proposition there that has yet to be sort of um, approached. And then, but finally is prepare for your economic life. Mm. And ironically, this is the, the biggest reason behind the rationale of putting so much of like society's capital and into families' capitals into college is because it prepares you for your economic life. It's, it's, it's a ticket to the middle class. It's upward mobility. It's, it's all that kind of stuff. And yet it's the, the thing that um, colleges, um, for the most part, feel the least responsible to and are the least set up to actually deliver. And that's why what you're seeing is that what we're all trying to do here is bridge that gap with solutions that create new pathways to actually do that piece that is so important, which is like, okay, like, great, you can read and you can write, supposedly, but, like, I don't, I, I, everybody can read or write. What can you do for me in the office day one if I hire you? And I think that question is, become, is more on top of people's minds, especially as um, in corporate America the pressure's on yeah. and, and the labor market is not what it used to be. And the tolerance in the system to let somebody just sort of apprentice under you for years has gotten less. There's an expectation you can add value right away. And um, that is the problem in the economy and that's what I always think of this as like retrofitting. We're taking like buildings that were built as liberal arts professionals, whatever that means, and we're turning them into, you know, technology professionals. Yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, you know, I, I think Jake makes a couple really good points. You know, I think schools like ours are also going to pressure universities to evolve, because they're going to have to. I mean, when you look at the, the, the debt situation with student debt right now, you know, in, in the economy, that's something like $1.4 trillion of student debt. And what does that really mean? It means people are going to school and getting degrees and coming out and not getting jobs or taking jobs really just to service their debt. So you have this cycle where people are basically paying banks for the interest on the debt that they took to get a degree that's worthless. And it's a problem. You know, they could be buying cars, they could be buying houses, they could be buying, you know, consumer goods, which generate, you know, more jobs in the economy. And it's just this vicious cycle we, that we're in, and I don't think it's going to get any better until companies like ours start pressuring universities to actually give more skills-based education, yep. which is what's going to happen. And then the other, you know, tangent to that is just the financing. How mm -hmm. do you finance mm -hmm. education going forward in this country? Yeah, uh, I know, Jake, you've talked about the government being the balance sheet of education. Well, that, that's how it's been always thought of, right? And I mean, it's, this, it's, it's literally, it's so similar to the housing market in this regard, right? And people don't really talk about it. And we all know kind of what happened to the housing market. And it's a classic third-party payer problem, right? And it, healthcare, I believe, is very similar this way. When, when the person who's consuming a good and the person who's selling the good, neither of whom are the person who's providing the financing for that good, you tend to have massive price increases. The price of education tuition has risen faster than health care, um, twice the rate of inflation. Um, you have a lot less accountability or consumer protection or any of these kind of things in the process. And I think you've seen that dynamic um, very, very much so. I, I actually think colleges have a much bigger problem, which is that it's a classic innovator's dilemma. They have giant physical plant. <coughs> um, <laughs> and and that's, that's just like classic fixed costs. Yeah. Right? They have they, they are built on a model of like 40, 50, 60 grand a year um, per person to kind of get that thing in. You can't just make that up by quadruple the people and 25% of the cost. It's not going to happen. And so as cost becomes an issue, we have a real crisis about who pays what, when, where, why, and how. And I think for all the talk about technology and education, that the real innovations are all happening around that issue. Um, we're doing a lot of experiments with income share agreements, things like that. But I think the most powerful concept is one that really harkens back to like the sort of great industrial age of the United States. I mean, GE, if you worked at GE and AT&T back in 1945, or 1950 actually, post-war, let's do it that, um, in 1950, 
they had a university campus that you would go to. You had the opportunity to revisit that campus. Mm -hmm. You had mentors. You had a pathway. You had certifications you would get along the way. You had a sense of where your career could and couldn't go based on the track you were on. That has all been lost as employee tenure goes down and employ employer investment goes went down with it. There is this moment to sort of reformulate that and get companies who want to make those investments, but also do it in a way that's like ergonomic to the modern world. Leah, I want you to jump in here because this is a perfect entryway for you to talk about how you're working with industries and companies such as Google to develop coursework uh, for people who could one day use Google products or perhaps be employed by Google. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think Jake highlights the problem well, and none of us really know whether the university is going to move fast of us to solve some of the challenges he highlighted. But the big set of institutions that could fall into that place are the companies. Right now, the corporate training market, for example, is about $20 billion, not small at all. The sad thing is that the vast majority of that market is focused on cl compliance training, har harassment training, and really just skills on courses on how to do your job which is not going to fill the, the problems that we're talking about. What we're seeing, though, and I think we're all seeing this, is that companies are increasingly trying to say, how do I actually proactively jump in to solve the skills gap? And there's two different trends we see. So the big tech companies are really an interesting position, because they realize that if there are not enough skilled workers out there, they're not going to be able to sell their stuff. <laughs> So Google, for example, recently launched a bunch of um, certificate programs for their cloud, cloud developers, um, as well as an IT certificate program, because they realize that if they don't tra train the world on how to engage with the cloud, what's going to happen there? Business. No one will know how to use it. No one will how to use, know how to use it. And that's sort of one big trend we see. The other big trend we see is where companies are actually putting in very, very, very methodical programs to upskill people, despite the fact that they know that every year, you know, half their workforce, 30% of their workforce may leave. So for example, AT&T is a fascinating case. Here you have one of the global giants um, of American history that is suddenly realizing that they're going to have to become a tech company, they estimate, by 2020. And they estimate that about 30% of their workforce is not going to have a job. But unlike Google or Facebook or these hot companies that can attract the te best talent, they realize that they need to actually retrain their folks into these new jobs. So these are the type of um, partnerships and work that companies Isn't like Isn't AT&T already a tech company? Also, it's a good <laughs> I, think, I think with Time Warner, they're at least a media company. I don't okay. know if they're a tech company, though. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, you have the, the workforce is changing, right? People are staying at, at, at their jobs for less and less time. I mean, 50 years ago, you would get a job at Kodak, and you would stay there for your entire career. You'd be a lifer. You'd be a lifer. That doesn't happen anymore. You know, people are staying two, three, four years. So companies are going to have to start introducing some short-term training, now, uh, pretty much as a retention tool. You know, come here, continuing education. However, there's this hesitation to... You know, th there's this fear that you start training your employees on skills that are not necessary to their job, and they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, s companies are going to have to start looking at it as more of a retention tool and a recruitment tool than as a, uh, yeah. as a risk. Here's my problem with companies and how they train workers. Sometimes I feel like they're asking too much of their workers. You know, do your own job that we pay you to do. Also, do this, train how to do this other job that one day we uh, want you to do, all on your own time well, I think while that, you're here. That is the bullshit of the like online learning revolution as it's preached inside companies with L and D professionals. I mean, it's it's constant. I see it all the time. And you have companies who are built on this this idea that basically like giving ac employees access mm -hmm. to a giant video cat catalog and then saying have fun is you doing your job and helping them develop and and it's 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 ridiculous um, and where we're seeing companies, and, and by the way, there's zero results from it. The engagement rates are single digits. Nobody will ever tell you this. Um, you know, they typically have to charge, you know, pennies on the dollar just to get get their product in those companies because it's it's such a zero marginal cost, low value thing. Where we're seeing companies who are truly serious about investing, what are they doing? Is they are thinking about this in relation to talent acquisition. Right? They are thinking about this in, in relation to talent retention. And the reality is, is if you look at HR, on one hand, you, know, you have like talent acquisition on the, over here, you got administration, and you got L&D. The tiniest budget by far is L&D. Mm -hmm. The biggest budget by far is talent acquisition. And what we're seeing company, and what we're spending a lot of time preaching to companies, is you got to flip that ratio. Um, and there's a way to do it. But, but you know, because there's sort of a, it's a vicious cycle. 
because it, this is what happens, right? For a long time, these kind of corporate training things, especially even online stuff or whatever, it was like this kind of like, yeah, but what value? You're the CFO. What value am I getting for this? Do I really have to put that line item in next year on my budget? And so then it get, the budget gets less. And so then the people who work in that division are, are, are no less passionate, but a little beaten down. Yeah. Um, and then the products that get made to sell into those categories are, are sort of lesser in their ambitions because that's all the money that there is there to pay. And, and you've seen that. I mean, the, the cynicism in that world. And so then it just the cycle sort of continues and continues and continues. And I think what's necessary is to sort of unlock this idea that there are other ways to do this. Again, it's who pays what, when, why, where, and yeah. how. And when you flip those models, all of a sudden new things just come to life. The money is there. The thinking is not. Yeah. I think the time is also there. I mean, I think it's an interesting question is the problem. Are people not learning because they don't have enough time? And I think to myself, do we have enough time to work out? If you care about something, you make time for it. The companies that I've seen be most successful are actually, what they're doing is they're providing good incentives for why people should learn. So either they're saying that you'll get a promotion as a as a result of taking this training, or what AD and T is doing is they're saying, we don't care what you're doing now. If you study, so if you're in finance, you want to study data science, you want to study coding, if you finish your coursework, we'll actually put a flag on your CV internally, and we will let you interview for any other job in the company. People find time to learn. <laughs> People find time to learn also by going to coding boot camps, like mm -hmm. the one that you run, Jeremy. Talk a little bit about how you managed to avoid going under in this consolidation of the coding boot camps. Because there have been a number of them, and they've all kind of been absorbed into other companies. You know, I, so is his. He's got a good accent. Right, yeah. Which is why I want you to talk about well, that. So, you know, we started on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you know, <laughs> Look, I was a, I was a, a tech so banker for a long time, uh, you know, and I can't tell you how many companies that I would talk to, literally we would build a financial model, and I would say, well, when does the revenue start coming in? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we don't need revenue. Like, revenue, we'll think about revenue later. And it was just this typical tech mentality of build it, and then, like, we'll worry about the revenue later. And from that, I took, well, let's worry about the revenue now. So when I built the company, I built it small. I built it disciplined. We, were, you know, we raised a very small amount of money, um, and we were profitable. And then, uh, you know, see Jake over here raising, you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. I figured, oh, sadly, you know, it's, it's now 100. <laughs> 110. <laughs> <laughs> and I, saw, I said, let's, we got to get, you know, let's go out for a raise. I had one of my investors uh, runs uh, Third Kind Capital, Shauna Fisher. And she said, look, we got to, let's, let's go out and raise some money. So we went out to do a Series A, and it was in that process where uh, we were actually negotiating a couple different deals. And um, I was working with Strayer, which is the company that ended up acquiring us. The for-profit education, for education company. The for-profit education company. And we were helping them to try to like rejigger their IT programs to make them a little bit more competitive. But you know, they always tell you to focus when you're doing a startup, so I kind of shut that down. And um, the CFO came and said, hey, if you guys are doing a round, we'd love to invest. And, you know, of course, we said, sure, you know, we're, you know, you're trying to fill out a round, you're, you're looking for, for capital. And then eventually that conversation turned into, it doesn't make much sense for us to invest, we want to acquire. And at that point, you say, you know, we're not for sale, but if you make us an offer, you can't refuse. And they were in a position where they had 80 locations around the country. Most of their students were going online. You know, they do a lot of, uh, you know, online learning for working adults. And... Um, they had a lot of empty space. And a lot of these companies were, you know, a lot of my competitors were going out and signing expensive leases in, you know, in big cities and really loading their P&L with a lot of expense. And I saw this as a way to scale, but, you know, the real estate was already paid for. Mm -hmm. And uh, the deal made sense. Uh, you hate to talk about synergies in investment banking because Lord knows that how many, com you know, how many deals have, uh, have blown up because of the overestimation of synergies. But, um, we really saw them in this case, and it's turned out to be that way. So you gained infrastructure, you gained access to strayers on uh, sites around the country. Mm -hmm. You're still called New York Coding and Design, New York Code and Design Academy. Does that limit what you're able to do? Because people think of you as this company based in New York. You know, that's always the eternal question. Um, but I, I believe in the brand. I believe in the brand of New York. I believe in the brand of, of New York and tech. And look, you go to, you go to China, you go to. Europe, you'll see people wearing New York Yankees hats. I mean, New York has a global presence. 
Talk a little bit about your alumni network, because traditionally there's a lot of Cornell alumni, as Keith pointed out here, sitting uh, in this room, including Jeremy and myself. But how do you engage and interact with people who graduate from General Assembly, from Coursera, yeah. from New York Code and Design Academy? So, so at this stage, we now have <laughs> 50,000 alumni from our three-month programs, um, part-time and full-time, all around the world. And I always talk about this as our great unmonetized asset that is the, the heart of what Do they give money to you guys and you No, that's the most beautiful thing. Building? So here's, we have people, they are in the most upwardly mobile part of their career. They have the most valuable skills in the world right now and they're located in the hottest cities where the economy is booming around these skills. And unlike most traditional universities, my interaction with them is not calling them up and asking them for money, right? When Yale calls me, I don't pick up the phone, right? <laughs> That's a problem. It's a terrible waste of, of a relationship and a network that could be used for good. Um, our opportunity with that scale, um, and it's people with tons of complementary skills, right? We can introduce product managers and UX designers to web developers or entrepreneurs, it, it, and it happens constantly. Um, what we have seen is that the, because we're not doing that, our engagement rates are incredibly high. So about 40% of our alumni come back to campus once a quarter to do something with us. That could be tutoring um, a new cohort. Mm. It could be coming to a networking event. It could be coming to a weekend workshop on an advanced skill. Um, and so I've always seen that as one of the most important things. And I think what I think a lot about is how are we going to help them at the next stage of their career and the one after that? And, and how do I make sure that I can figure out a way to pay for it? Because I think <laughs> that's how we, you really create a, a brand that lasts at, as long and, and sits as looms as large as something like, you know, Cornell. Leah? Yeah. Little, I think Coursera. little pandering right there. Did you like that? No? <laughs> Shameless plug there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I think Coursera also has a fascinating relationship with alumni, and it's in two forms. One is that alumni actually power the site. So, you know, we're serving hundreds of thousands of learners a week, and so the alumni are in there, they're mentoring people, they're engaging in peer grading, because you couldn't possibly run an educational community um, merely with paying learners, so that's one. But the second thing is that, you know, the people who complete these courses are the holders of the brand in the workforce. And so if they're out there having gained skills, and when they see a new candidate that comes in that says they completed Coursera courses on their CV, they know what that means, and they will actually reach out and, and hire. And though we haven't put formal um, programs in that place, I think that's why you see the proliferation of uh, degrees on, of Coursera creds on LinkedIn. And for those of you who have taken a Coursera course, I mean, ask yourself, when you see others who have that, what does it mean to you? Because you know it's not easy to get through you know, online courses sitting here by yourself. I think it's much easier to actually come to an institution like this and have people hit you on the head and say, we're going to learn and we're going to get through this together. Yeah, it takes an incredible amount of self-motivation and For discipline. Sure. Jeremy, talk about the alumni that you have at New York Code and Design Academy. You know, when you, when you have a product that works, you generate really passionate alumni. And you know, we've seen that at all of our campuses. Uh, you know, all, all of our campuses are, are connected uh, through sort of an online communication platform. And you can go on at any time at night, it could be 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and actually find current students asking questions to the alum, or the, you know, asking questions to the community and having alumni answering those questions, which is just such a beautiful, you know, environment. And then with, it's organic. It's, or, it's organic. And then what you have is you have alumni hiring. Now, they're so passionate about the brand, they're so passionate about the school, that they start hiring graduates. And once you get that, it's, you, know, you just get into that really nice virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you know, in terms of just New York, you know, I think all of the boot camp graduates from all of the different schools are also now forming their own communities and meetups and things like that. And uh, you know, I think they all advocate for each other, which is a good thing, because at first, when we got started, I'm sure Jake could attest to this, that, you know, Schools looked at, or companies looked at us and said, you know, I'm never going to hire a boot camp grad. You know, we, we, we only hire from MIT. Mm -hmm. And that, that thinking has just shifted so much over the last five years. And it's because our alumni are out there in the workforce doing great things. All right, let's talk a little bit about the next big job that you're training the workforce for. Uh, Jake, you've talked about healthcare not being something that's vulnerable to robots taking over. I have talked about that. I am healthcare is sort of my white whale. Like I desperately want to do what we've done for tech jobs for healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a long road, 
I mean, it's a highly regulated right. sort of, I mean, it's, it, it, when you say healthcare, what specifically? Oh, I, I think nurses, medical assistants. I mean, allied health in general is one of the. It's because it's one thing to talk about the skills gap when you're talking about somebody's going to come out with a college degree and they have to do a three month course to get an eighty thousand dollar job. It's another thing when you talk about somebody going fifty grand in debt to get a forty thousand dollar a year job as a medical assistant. It is like literally a tragedy, and it makes no sense for the economy that we're trying, we're setting ourselves up for. Um, I don't think we're going to get there right away. It's when I, if anybody here has a lead for me, like it's my passion, I will go anywhere to think about it. Um, but I do think, look, I, I think at the end of the day, one of the ways I've always talked, thought about GA since the very beginning is the reality about you know web development or data science or digital marketing, they're all great, but they are really what I call the sexy tech jobs. They're at the very, very top of the stack, and, and it is for people who, you know, 90 plus percent of our of our students have a college degree, and frankly, the ones who don't are just like taking a break. They're all getting, right? This is not the majority of Americans, and the ability to pay is a huge barrier even around that. Um, if you think about jobs that pay 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year, um, that might not be as sexy. Um, people can't just shell $15,000 out to learn that skill. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work like that. And, and yet, I also don't want to go down that road of Title IV financing and all that kind of stuff. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we bridge these different groups that all want to see the same thing happen, but figure out how do we can funnel the financing to allow those kind of jobs to sort of have this kind of style of education, which we believe is much more efficient, much more targeted, and has a much higher return on investment. And I think in the, a lot of these cases, we're talking about a return on investment not just for the individual, but for the employer and for society as well. All right, I want to get to income sharing agreements with you in a moment, Jeremy, but first, Leah, you had mentioned that soft skills are very much in demand uh, in terms of whatever job you're training the workforce for, which might surprise a lot of people. Yeah, look, um, so a huge part of our companies, for example, are taking different forms of tech and data science skills, but they're often always pairing it with different types of soft skills, whether, whether it be leadership or influence. And if you talk to anyone about the future of work, everyone's worried about automating and realizing that the thing that we'll be left with is our creativity, our ability to interact with other people. And those are skills that actually most of us don't learn in, even in undergraduate school. I think MBAs are probably the one degree these days that actually put some focus on management and leadership, and regardless of whether Maybe. you think that's uh, yeah, so I didn't go they, through an We MBA. didn't learn that at Wharton. We only learned that at do spreadsheets. I can tell you in law school, we didn't learn. I thought you learned negotiating in law school. That's not soft no, skills. No, I went over the I went over the business school to learn negotiation. But yeah, no, there's no there's very little attention to soft skills in I think traditional education today. Um, so we've taken a lot of the traditional business school courses and they're put onto Coursera in a different form and they're they're taking it off. It's actually our second biggest category, hmm. and we'll see how that evolves over time. But I don't see any stopping. Jeremy, soft skills are, are they a big part of your curriculum? Absolutely, I and mean, they're built into the curriculum. Everything from uh, you know, the whole outcomes piece to our curriculum is designed to encourage students to actually make an effort to go out and get that job. How to write a corporate email. How to, uh, you know, how to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, how to confront someone. How to confront somebody. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, and those don't get taught at universities. You know, the, most universities have very, very poor outcome support for their students. And uh, it's something that we take very seriously. Let's talk about income sharing agreements because Jake was talking about the financing, how to pay for it. You guys have come up with an income sharing agreement where, give us the details. How do the students pay or how much do they pay? So again, we, we get back to this problem with taking on student debt to go get you know, education. And, uh, you know, and we also, as a, as a code school, are not eligible for Title IV. So people can't go out and get you know, cheap forms of financing. Mm -hmm. And hundreds of students have been trying to come to school with us over the last couple of years and just have not been able to get the financing. Whether they have uh, bad credit or no credit, there's just too much talent being left on the sidelines. And, you know, we've been thinking about a way, how do we solve this? How do we flip the financing model where, uh, you know, we can basically put our money where our mouth is. And the idea is the what we call the income share agreement. Essentially, students come to the school. They do not pay tuition until they graduate and get a job that pays them more than $40,000 a year. And essentially what they're doing is they're getting, uh, they're basically paying us 8% of their annual income mm -hmm. until they pay their full tuition. There's no 
you know, it's, it's not like if you take the income share agreement and the school is 15000 you're going to pay 20000 The tuition is $15,000. It's almost like an installment plan. It doesn't turn on until you get your job. And what happens if they don't get a job? You eat it? Then we haven't done our job, and we don't deserve to get paid. Okay. <laughs> Applause. Thank you. Let's get to a lightning round where we just kind of go through some random questions I wanted to throw in there. Um, what's your advice to the next... To, okay, what's your advice to an elementary school teacher that's educating kids who eventually will go to a college and then probably to one of your institutions? Leah? I think kids need to be self-conscious and learn how, how to learn um, and really refine that skill. And are teachers capable of teaching that right now? I think they could become. I think they are capable. I think most people aren't used to being taught that, but there's a ton of methodology um, mm -hmm. specifically on how to teach. It's actually the most popular course on Coursera, Learning How to Learn. You should, you That's should the name of the out. course, Learning That's How to Learn. That's the name of the course, is, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. It goes all through neuroscience, and it talks through the different sides of the brain and different types of learning and how some of the most famous people... I'm not going to tell you what happened, but you should, you should, you should, <laughs> That's check, a it. Teaser. You should check it out. Um, because if you're studying late night in exams and you're going through this program, I guarantee you will be much more efficient. Is that Coursera.edu? Uh, Coursera.org. <laughs> Jake, what about you? Uh, I always like to say uh, there's no more money coming in the higher education um, world. And so, and we, uh, we can underestimate how much of that money goes to remediation. Uh, around basics that don't get taught in elementary and high school. And so what I would like to say is I think, I think it's expect more and demand numeracy and literacy as soon as possible because it's numeracy uh, being comfortable with quantitative <laughs> concepts and numbers. Um, mm -hmm. It is going to be the skill of the future. Um, it is where the jobs are, and everybody is going to be expected to be literate with data, be able to generate insights, be able to generate basic analysis at the very least. Um, and um, I think the biggest challenge is, is like we should not be doing vocational training for kids. Um, I think it's great to use coding as a way to teach quantitative and logic concepts to kids, but let's not kid ourselves. It is not vocational training to kids. It's stupid to, to train them because in 20 years it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And you need to, and, and so the real thing is to get them excited about learning, get them excited about math and science. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, we, you know, in our, our, data, our di digital marketing credential, you know what the, the best performing country is for digital marketing? Singapore. You know why? Because they have the least gap between men and women in their quantitative scores across the board. Ours, we have, it's, it's, nobody talks about it. We have like a massive gap in gender by the time we reach, and that's not there when they start, right? right? We need to be focused on those kinds of issues because that, that is going to, what's going to drive the opportunity and the inequality gaps going forward. Do teachers take your courses at New York Coding Design Academy and apply some of what they learn to they, their instruction? They do. In fact, there's a funny story. I have a younger brother who's a Latin teacher in Williamsburg, and I remember him deciding to, you know, become a Latin teacher. I said, don't learn Latin. You know, it's a, don't it's a dead learn language. a dead language. So, of course, he, you know, doesn't take my advice on that, and he goes, gets his master's in, in, in Latin. And, um, you know, teach, first of all, like, teaching is hard. You know, we, we lump teachers into a category, but there's a big difference between an experienced teacher and a new teacher, right? A, a, Commanding a classroom as a new teacher is an incredibly difficult skill. It requires management, it requires patience and empathy and all of these things that they don't teach you in Latin classes. So he comes out of his first year of teaching and he's miserable. And I said, you know, Case, you're good at, you're good at languages. Why don't you come take one of our code classes and maybe you'll learn something, maybe it's a new potential career opportunity. Just, you know, you gotta, you gotta try something. So he takes the class. He returns to his, his charter school in Williamsburg, and the principal finds out that he you know, took a coding class. She says, you know, you're a new coding instructor. Hmm. He's like, what do you mean? I don't know how Based to on that. code. But the reality was that he knows how to teach, and he knew enough of the coding to be able to fashion a curriculum. And now, out of five sections a day that he teaches, he teaches four coding in one Latin. The new language, coding. Um, Leah. Oh, please, no, don't say that. <laughs> it's not true. Coding is not a language. <laughs> it's a lifestyle? It, no, it's a... 
<laughs> for some of us. Actually, that's good. I like that. It is coding is coding is is not. It, it is a it is a way of doing math, and okay. and I mean it was um, computer science was developed by mathematicians. It is a form of logic, and really, um, it, it's a logic machine at its core. Um, because we use the word language, we talk about Java or Python or whatever, people just sort of easily made this jump to, oh, instead of Spanish, we should be learning like uh, coding. They're very, very different. It, coding should be replacing not Spanish class, but calculus. Um, that is where the value is going to be had. I tried to make the argument to the New York State regulators back in the day that co our, our classes are actually language classes and should fit under that rubric so you don't have to get your, you know, you don't have to get an education license, but How'd that go? not well. <laughs> <laughs> we got a license a couple of months later. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you could do it all over again, would you still go to Brown University for undergrad, go to Yale Law School, pop over to the business school to learn the soft skills? I mean, is that still the path you would take to, to get to where you are now? Um, so look, it would have been much more efficient if I wanted to go to tech to jump out of high school and join Google or Facebook or one of these schools, but I would. I mean, for me, my education, it both taught me to think broadly, but then law school, even though I'm really doing very little in law now, it gave me an incredibly powerful network, and it happened to be a place where you know they empowered you to think big and made you, made you think that you could actually do anything you want. So I don't think that that type of ethos and inspiration and sense of purpose is something that people are getting from online and other educational experiences are. I bet the folks in your boot camps and your classes are getting the sense that they can take over the world, but that's what I got from those mm -hmm. schools, so I would probably do it Was again. it worth like $500,000? That's the Probably question. not. Would you go to Wharton <laughs> again? You know, I, I, first off, I hate that question because how am I supposed to answer? If I say, if I say no... I'm an asshole, and if I say yes, I'm, I don't feel like I'm telling the full tr truth. I think the answer is it's path dependent. I think I got something out of them. Um, they, were, worth they were not a complete waste of time. <laughs> wow, uh, a lot of hedging. I think they could have. I think I could have gotten a lot more value for the money. Yeah. And I think some of that was their fault, and some of it was mine. Jake Schwartz, ambassador. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy, you would still go to Cornell, right? Absolutely. I mean, I had a great time. I loved it. I loved it. Oh, no, I got to tell you, you know, <laughs> you ain't no, Cornell sucks. Um, <laughs> but I didn't go to business school. You know, I, I looked at that choice. Do I go to business school and, you know, put myself into another, you know, $150,000 of debt, or do I you know, go cut my teeth on Wall Street and figure out how to build financial models. And, and that's what I did. And at the time, I was 26 years old. You know, I was working at the film school, which was also a really good education. I mean, it taught me how to negotiate. It taught me how to put deals together. But at, you know, I, I went to Lehman Brothers first and went through their analyst program. I was a 26-year-old in a class of 22-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might have been a step back. And I was really, you know, worried about that. But it turned out to be an incredible experience. And I couldn't do what I do today without every step in my career along the way. All right, and with that, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. The gentleman in the blue plaid shirt will bring you a microphone. Pardon me. <coughs> this one's for uh, Jake. Actually, I met your co-founder at an interesting event that he came to last year called F Up Nights. And he talked about, I mean, it was a different type of entrepreneurial event where they discuss what they could have done differently, mm. different paths, and he went into from Yale to General Assembly to his newest thing. So if I was to put you in that perspective, what would you change about what you've done? There's like a hundred million things, <laughs> and um, I think anybody who says differently is like, I mean, crazy. Uh, I would say... Man, I don't know. I think, to be honest, I think I think I would have. I'm not saying I would have done it differently. I would have thought a lot harder about raising venture capital. You know, we've raised over 100 million at this point. Really interesting experience. Not all it's cracked up to be in a lot of ways, right? Um, I think it took away some drive to discipline um, that I think we would have benefited from earlier. Um, and I think we made some missteps because of the, the mixed 
um, incentives that we had, had gotten set up from that. Um, I would say probably the other thing is that, you know, we're, we're, we're so much of what's driving GA right now is we have injected software into everything we do. And we are delivering in a blended and a hybrid and a networked format in, in so many different little ways. And I'm seeing now the benefits of it um, in that way. And I, I think it was partly we were, it was time. But I think if I could go back, I would have pushed the investment into that like three years earlier than I did. Um, I was a little just worried about it because I, I thought outcomes was just always the most important thing. And like I didn't want to risk it. And I think now seeing how successful it can be, I wish we had done that earlier. A question. But I, I literally have 20 million other things, so <laughs> you can find me afterwards and I'll tell you. OK. A question for Leah or Jeremy? One for the panel. That's fine. Can I just speak up? Please. OK. <laughs> um, maybe this is beyond the scope, but the title gives me liberty. Can you, uh, any of you talk about the idea of a liberal arts education having a new model, I won't use the disrupted idea, such that if we buy into the idea that a liberal arts education creates a well-rounded person, grounded in common culture, who can effectively participate in society, that seems to be broken as well, economically. Can that be replaced? Well, I think there's. Uh, you know, liberal arts education is, you know, look, it worked for me, right? It, looked, it taught me how to think. It taught me how to interact with people. I'm sorry? It's pricey. It's pricey, and that's the problem. You know, you cannot be getting a liberal arts education that does not position you for a real career and rack up hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. So either that model is going to change, and universities are going to have to incorporate a little bit more skills-based education, or tailor their degrees so people have to, you know, decide what tracks they want to go to, or they're going to have to change their financing model and perhaps start introducing things like the income share agreement. And you know, I think as we pursue that, as alternative credentialed schools like ours pursue that, it's going to put some pressure on universities to do the same thing. But I don't think that the current model is going to, you know, I don't think universities are going to look the same as they do 15 years from now. Leah? Yeah, look, I tend to agree. Look, I think liberal arts education is incredibly important, but it certainly doesn't take four years. It either takes one or two, or it takes a lifetime. I mean, you could get a full liberal arts education on Coursera, and there's folks out there that think that to really be trained in the liberal arts, you should be subscribing to an education like that throughout your lives. So I agree, it's going to look different um, over time, because it just doesn't make economic sense for people to be paying what they want to get the liberal arts. Gentleman in the front with the dark jacket, can we pass the mic over? So each of you have um, alluded to that your alumni are actually hiring your new graduates. What does it take to jump to where the, um, the recruiting offices of these companies uh, show up at your facilities and campuses or websites and start basically recruiting there? That's, that's already happening yeah, at massive scale. Uh, we have about 3,000 um, employer partners in our database. Um, almost every night of the week at some campus around the world, you'll see a hiring event that's filled with employers. Um, and, and frankly, I think the next stage of that is actually more, is that we are creating um, longer term relationships where they are um, working with us to plan ahead to what their next class you know, is going to be. Um, and my goal is to then turn that to the next stage and have them get their own pipeline that they pay for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask any company in any industry, whether it's healthcare or you know, uh, finance or tech, do you want skilled developers? The answer is going to be yes. And that's what we provide. So you know, as long as we're putting out good product, they're going to come for it. You know, the, the next step is them paying for the student's education. You know, that's yeah. only, you know, that's custom classes and things like that, which already happens. Yeah, that's interesting. On the Coursera side, we're also seeing something slightly different, which is that companies are coming to us and saying, can you create a mini course sequence that everyone applies to our company 
will have to go through. So major insurance company just asked us for this. And they're trying to do two things. One, they're trying to actually replace the first year's training program that they usually have for new and entering grabs. But they're also trying to figure out who actually cares and wants to get through it. Uh, um, so I think you know that's some of what's being tested and shown when people go through any of these programs, um, for sure. Yep. Gentleman with the purple check shirt. Question for Leah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, soft skills being a big focus as part of Coursera. Yeah. So there's a big difference between learning some of these harder skills, which is all about knowledge, versus soft skills, which take a lot of practice. So how are we, as, a, as an industry, trying to tackle that? And, and how are companies receiving that in terms of how are they measuring what exactly is the outcome out of that online learning of soft skills? Of soft skills training? Look, I think it's happening at, at a in a number of different ways, right? Traditionally, within companies, you would have senior leaders go through executive education. And a lot of that training was with management and leadership skills. Um, but now you're seeing this being offered to, to employees throughout, across the board. And I think where you see it is actually when you start serving, surveying employees on their experiences within companies. You know, classic employee service. Are your teams collaborating? Are you happy at work? Do you have a feeling of purpose? Do you have clear goals? These are all pretty measurable outcomes of the leadership at companies and also the skills that people on teams have. Um, but very few people have traditionally connected educational inputs into these type of um, algorithms. So it's starting to happen. And look, the reason why this never happened before is because it's hard to teach soft skills at, at scale. Um, you know, one of the biggest biggest areas the corporate learning folks is I need to train my first year managers, and the way we usually do this is we fly them all into <laughs> into one office and we pay ten thousand per person and they do it, and you know that's just not scalable. So what we're trying to figure out is new ways that everyone can actually learn these types of skills very early on in their in their careers and continue to do so. We have time for one final question, uh, gentleman over here in the purple shirt. Oh. Sorry, lots of purple shirts tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea of a uh, flipped classroom where the content is consumed at home, your, prof uh, your professors can teach once and do the best job and not have to worry about being live every time. Is this something that you're experimenting with in, in your boot camps? Uh, is it working? And would you recommend that for higher education so that it's sort of a win-win? I mean, the mm -hmm. students can watch what they know faster, what they don't know slower, and your professors can do what they do, which is help students instead of just uh, you know standing up and and talking at them. So we've we you know for a long time about 15% of our um, immersive programs. Um, little fun fact: we don't call them boot camps because when we did a bunch of studies on why women weren't applying to the software part of our business, it was because, because of was, the word. It was boot intimidating. Camp. It was yeah. like. Uh, it, it, it has this, oh, you can't do this. It's like PX90 or whatever it's called, P90X, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, our immersive programs um, was always about 15% remote and online. Um, and a lot of what we've been doing recently is sort of extending that and experimenting with the, the, the answer is all offline is not ideal. Um, all online is definitely not ideal. There is some mix, and what I've told my team and what we talk a lot about is it's the right tool for the right job. And you've got to find for each part of the learning and each part of the journey what makes the most sense, right? And, and, and it's also, I would say, the biggest thing for us is, is how do we deliver the knowledge piece of it, the content, in the most efficient way? but also make room for the, that, the part of that that's learning, the social interaction. Um, our most successful innovation is not actually the flipped cat classroom, it's the networked classroom. We now have about five of our campuses that are all hooked up together. And we will often have cohorts that are now much larger, actually. But where um, the feedback from students is just amazing because they get to connect to a, a wider community every single day. And it's, it was a lot of investment in hardware and experimentation. But I think there's a lot of ways to use technology to make it better. But it's about being really thoughtful about why are you trying to do it. It's, it can't just be to save costs, right? Um, which was sort, is sort of the, the default, like, oh, software makes it cheap, you know? It's, it's not like that at all. Yeah, on our front, we, so a lot of our universities actually use the Coursera courses back at their universities. So the professors no longer give the lectures, but they watch the lectures on Coursera. And then in seminars, they discuss what's, 
what's going on. Um, and we see the same thing in the companies. So I'll give you an example. One of our one of the biggest tech companies out west is now trying to chain, train 4,000 folks in machine learning. Uh, but they've basically designed a curriculum where they hold essentially brown bag lunches. They've identified who are the top learners within each of these courses, and then they pull those the learners together and in in to do applied tasks um, across offices like Jake is describing. And that's, you know, there's just so many models evolving out there with all sorts of different uses of technology. What's interesting, I'd say, in my world is we're getting data on all these different mm. um, experiments that are able to see what works best and in what context. Yeah, I'd say it's all about finding the right balance. You know, you have to have so much value happens in the classroom, the interaction between the students themselves, the interactions with the instructors, the TAs, but it has to be supported with some online content so the student can catch up if they, you know, if they, uh, you know, didn't catch a concept. So again, it's just finding the right balance. All right, and with that, I want to thank our panelists. Lee Bowski, Vice President of Coursera, Jake Schwartz of General Assembly, and Jeremy Snepper of Near Code and Design Academy. Stay put, everyone, because we have Deborah Estrin of Cornell Tech to give our closing remarks. I just wanted to thank you all for coming and joining us on this spectacular campus. Uh, it's still spectacular to us every day when we come onto the campus. And more important than that, we have uh, now over 30 faculty, over 300 students. Uh, who have benefited from a lot of what you do. We recruit students who have taken uh, your courses, experienced uh, boot, your boot camps. Um, I use it as a, as a screening and as a way of uh, some students to actually get admitted, uh, as some of them will, will tell you. And um, we do a lot here that our students have already, we've already graduated 300 students and um, who are all out there working, I'm happy to say, and we feel uh, uh, very proud and obligated to continue that trend. And we are also a faculty of uh, PhD and PhD students doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of research here. So that gives our students an exposure to something that you still only get by studying science and technology at a research university. So um, I think it's, uh, I'll talk to Dan, my uh, dean, who put me up here to uh, stand up here in defense of traditional uh, <laughs> academics after all of you. Now I know why he wasn't in town this evening. Um, but um, really, seriously, I think that you all add a tremendous amount to uh, what will make us all and our students all lifelong learners. And that's really essential. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice. Thanks.